Okay. Good evening, everyone. As Patty said, my name is Debbie Flegel. I am the uh, program manager for Trees Forever. Um, I am located uh, near Peoria. So um, I cover the whole northern half of the state. Um, I am a certified arborist. I'm also trained in tree risk assessment. And as part of that, I also manage our Illinois Urban Forest Strike Team. So Patty asked me to speak tonight on um, what, what should we be replanting after a natural disaster? So we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about um, a little bit about Trees Forever, give you an idea of who we are. Uh, Trees Forever is a nonprofit organization in Iowa and Illinois, and we've just started working in Wisconsin this spring. And our mission is to plant and care for trees in the environment by empowering people, building community, and promoting stewardship. We've been around since 1989, so just starting our 33rd year of programming. We have a staff of 22 um, working in Iowa and Illinois. Uh, the majority of our staff is located in Iowa, and there are two of us in Illinois. Um, like I said, I'm in near P just south of Peoria, and my colleague Emily, she is down in southern Illinois, down near Alton. And so between the two of us, we cover the whole state. Um, we've planted just about three and a half million trees between our two states. We've had national projects and national recognition, and we are a um, member-based organization supported by individuals to continue our programming. On average, yearly, we provide assistance to over 200 communities and landowners and farmers annually. We work with about 7,000 volunteers and we give out almost $650,000 in grants every year. So to start, why do we plant trees? Well, we, we plant trees for energy savings, for energy efficiency, to help cool our homes, um, shade our streets, shade our um, schools and playground equipment. We plant trees for wildlife and pollinator habitat. We plant trees to help uptake our stormwater, reduce flooding, improve air quality, reduce air pollution, um, community beautification, and much more. But what happens when this happens? And unfortunately, uh, Woodridge was impacted last summer on Father's Day, I believe, by a tornado. This is not Woodridge. This was... Um, a picture of Washington, Illinois. They were hit uh, by an F4 tornado in 2013, which is not too far from me. Um, so everything is susceptible when, when we have natural disasters, particularly our trees in addition to our buildings and, and uh, other uh, things. The, what happens to the trees during a tornado is that leaves and branches are stripped off. Trees are uprooted, twisted, and broken. Um, and if winds are greater than 200 miles an hour, the, the trees can completely be debarked. Um, the, the bark can be stripped off um, by, by small flying debris. Uh, very susceptible trees include those that have um, included bark. So this large tree right here in the foreground where it has um, two stems that has included bark. It has weak branching junctures, um, internal decay, cracks, older trees that have any dead wood and trees that are leaning more than 45 degrees. Those are very susceptible to uh, being destroyed in tornadoes. Other factors that impact trees during a, a tornado include um, unbalanced canopy or unbalanced crown. So maybe it's uh, all of the leaves are lean towards one side of the tree versus the other. Many small twigs and branches and particularly fast growing trees such as maples are more susceptible to the wind damage. Some of the more wind resistant types of trees include um, white oaks and swamp white oaks. Kentucky coffee tree, ginkgo, northern catalpa, bald cypress, sweet gum, 
and serviceberry, among many others. So our slower growing trees that don't expend all of their energy uh, growing fast, those are the ones that are going to be more wind resistant. And one thing is that after a tornado, oftentimes residents who are impacted see their utility bills go up by a minimum of $60. We've had um, in multiple communities that we have um, visited after tornadoes, utility bills go up anywhere from $60 to $120 a month because of the shade that they no longer have from the trees. One thing that you need to consider, um, it's a cleanup and replanting and rebuilding, it takes time. We still have communities that we've worked with three and four years ago and they are still in the rebuilding process. Um, so this is not something that is quick or happens overnight. Um, but one thing is you need to consider if your tree is damaged, is it salvageable? Can you save it? Or is it or does it have to be removed? This tree here um, was from the uh, 2020 tornado that hit Ottawa. Um, this one did have to be removed. But things to consider are what was the tree's health prior to the tornado? Was it in really good condition? Um, was it in poor condition and dying? What is the age of the tree? What species is it? So, for instance, a damaged ash tree would not be as important to save as a mature oak tree. Is it suitable for where it was planted? What is the potential for future injury? Is, is the same area prone to be hit again, maybe by flooding or another windstorm? And when was the timing of the disaster? Was it during the growing season when the, the leaves, the tree was um, all leafed out or when it was, or during the dormant season when all of the leaves had fallen off the tree? And then what was the extent of the damage? So this is the biggest factor. Um, if a tree has lost more than 50% of its crown, which means more than 50% of its leaves are gone, um, or more than 30% of the circumference of the trunk, or it leans more than 45 degrees, it, it's not safe. It has to come out, it has to be removed. So if more than 50% of all the leaves are gone, uh, more than 30% of the circumference of the trunk, and it leans more than 45 degrees, it is not salvageable. So clearly this tree has lost half of its trunk. So this tree did have to be removed. But now we've cleaned up and now we're thinking about replanting. So what do we need to consider when it comes time to replant? So this, what type of tree should I plant? This is the most common question I get. And my standard answer is, I don't know. I can tell you what I like, but I don't know where you live. I don't know what the conditions of your property are. Um, so there are some factors that need to be considered when you're replanting trees. So the first one, what type of soil do you have? Do you have good Illinois black dirt? Do you have clay? Do you have sand? That's going to make a big difference in what type of tree you can plant. Does your yard where you're planning to plant these trees, are there wet areas? Are there dry areas? Um, think about after it rains, does water stand in this particular area of your yard? How much sunlight is in the area you're wanting to plant the tree? Does it have full sun, partial sun, or is it completely shaded? How much space do you have? Do you have a small yard, maybe 10 by 10 that you wanna put a tree in? In that case, you would wanna put a small tree. Do you have a wide open space um, with no conflicts? Then you could plant perhaps an oak tree. So 
space is a big factor on what size of tree you can plant. Do you have overhead utility lines? If so, then you need to plant a smaller tree that's not going to interfere with the utility lines. And then what kind of tree do you like? You know, I personally like oak trees. So any chance I get a, an opportunity to plant an oak tree, I'm gonna do it. Um, others like other types of trees. So what do you like? What do you have a preference for? And then also you should check with your local tree board or city ordinances because they may have um, lists of prohibited trees that may be invasive species. Um, that they do not want planted within city property. Some examples of trees that are um, in, considered invasive would be the calorie or Bradford pears. All of the flowering pear trees are considered invasive in Illinois and also Norway maples. And that does include the cultivars of those such as the crimson king maple. But you should check with your local city ordinances to see if there are what prohibited trees in your community. Develop a plan. Have a plan of what you're gonna do. Don't just go out and willy-nilly stick a tree in the ground. Have a plan. Um, have a purpose for planting your tree. Why are you planting this tree? Is it for shade? To shade your house? Or shade your air conditioner? Is it because you want to have um, food for butterflies and birds. So you want to plant something that's going to attract uh, birds and provide food for them. Um, or is it because you want a tree that has beautiful spring flowers or beautiful fall color? Have a plan in place of what you want to do before you start looking for nurseries to purchase your trees. Large shade trees. So these are trees that are going to get greater than 60 feet tall should be a minimum of 30 feet away from the utility lines. Medium and large trees uh, should be 20 to 25 feet away from buildings. And small trees should be a minimum of 10 feet away from your buildings. And if you have a sidewalk on your property, plant your trees at least five feet away from the sidewalk. You want to make sure you're planting the right tree in the right place. These people are planting an oak tree. It looks like they have a wide open backyard, so there's no conflicts. So this tree is going to get large and mature, um, doesn't appear to be shaded at all. So this is the right place for this tree. Unfortunately, when we plant trees, they tend to be fairly small. And this tree was probably okay the size wise when it was planted, but clearly it is interfering with the power lines, it is interfering with traffic. Um, it had to be, be pruned by the utility companies, so this is the wrong tree for the wrong place. In a situation like this, you would want to plant a tree that gets less than 30 feet tall or even a, a large shrub. You would not want to plant a tree, for instance, an oak tree in this situation because it is going to get pruned by the utility companies. So thinking about species selection, what size trees are you going to, to purchase? You also want to think about um, pest and disease resistant trees. So due to um, Dutch elm disease. Uh, there are many different cultivars of elms that are resistant to that, that you can purchase. Um, ash is not recommended to be planted because of the emerald ash borer. Um, other diseases, uh, chestnut blight uh, affect the American chestnut. So find what species you want to plant and make sure you're getting one that is disease and pest resistant, if at all possible. This, uh, the sizes, now at Trees Forever, we don't recommend planting anything larger than two inches caliper, two inches around the trunk. And that is because um, 
that's about the maximum size that volunteers are able to easily plant without equipment. Much larger than that, you have to get equipment in to help plant the tree. Um, and then also look for the characteristic of the tree. A lot of people want trees that more are more round or maybe they're more pyramidal shape. So what types of, of things are you looking for for your tree? And then the biggest point I wanna emphasize is diversity. Um, you all know the neighborhoods you live in. You know what kind of trees perhaps are in your neighborhood or if not in your neighborhood, what you have in your yard. So you wanna plant a diversity of species. You do not want to plant 10 trees of the same species in your yard because you never know when the next disease or pest is going to come through. So diversity, diversity, diversity. And just to, to give you a quick story, um, I had a friend of mine, they had a, um, a autumn blaze maple in their front yard and it was fairly close to the road. And then their subdivision did some road construction and rerouted the water that, that came off of the road and it basically killed that tree. And so they replanted with a Kentucky coffee tree and a red oak closer up to the house to help shade their house. And uh, they're the only ones in their neighborhood that have those species in their yard. So everyone else has very similar species of maples and ash. So think outside of the box and be different. Think of diversity of species. So I just want to show you some resources that Trees Forever has. This is our Trees Forever website. Um, if you go to um, the top here and click on learn, these resources on the right, resources, how to plant tree keepers, fruit tree keepers, students of the beautiful land will pop up. Under resources, you can choose species selection. And we have several um, resources uh, that can help you choose what species you want. We have um, trees for linear sites with overhead power lines. We have uh, trees for linear sites without overhead power lines. Trees that provide dense shade. Trees that provide moderate to sparse shade. Trees for windbreaks. Trees and shrubs for pollinators. We also have um, resources on how to um, talk to a nursery about purchasing trees, how to plant a tree, and it's all under this section of species selection. So feel free to go to our website and uh, peek around and find some resources that'll be beneficial for you. This is an example. This is our trees and shrubs for pollinators. All these resources are free for you to download. This is a four page document. This is just the front page. Um, all of these species are native to Illinois. Um, it gives the flower color if they have if they have flowers, what moisture level they need, whether they need wet soil, music, um, which is moist or dry, what their height of maturity is, when they bloom, what type of sunlight they need, whether it's full or part shade, and then which uh, pollinators these species attract. So if it has an X by the under bees, then that species is good for bees. So I'm just gonna go through some of a few different species that maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. And um, feel free to ask questions on them if you need to. So we're gonna start with some trees for pollinators. This is a river birch. It can be a single stem tree or a multi stem tree. Um, it does have the what's called exfoliating bark. It looks like it's peeling off. It gets about 40 feet tall at maturity. It does like full sun to partial sun. Um, many different types of insects feed on this. Um, it's a beautiful tree with its uh, simple leaves. Swamp white oak. 
is another great species. This one is gets a bit bigger. This is more of a medium to large tree. It gets up to 60 feet tall. It prefers full sun. Uh, these are very long lived trees. They can live up to 350 years. And the acorns on these trees provide food for many birds, mammals, as well as many different types of um, butterflies and moths feed are on the leaves of swamp white oak. All of our oaks, they don't have very showy flowers, but they are the first food source for many caterpillars of butterflies and moths. So if you wanna see pollinators, plant an oak tree. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a black cherry. Um, the bark is very unique looking. Uh, someone described it to me as looking like in the mature tree, looking like burnt potato chips. Very glossy leaves. It has a beautiful white flowers in the spring. Um, this tree actually flowers after it leaves out. Most of the others flower before they leaf out. The black cherry flowers after it leaves out. Um, you can tell it's a fruit tree because it has the lenticels or the little white dashed lines on the bark. Those are called lenticels. It has berries on it that are edible for the birds. Um, this tree gets up to 100 feet, so this would be a large shade tree. It's fairly fast growing and it likes full sun to very light shade. This is another one that's another, can be another large shade tree, a shagbark hickory. It's 80 feet tall, prefers full sun. Hickories are very slow growing. Um, they can be difficult to transplant and they can live up to 300 years or so. Um, it has this beautiful magenta colored flower in the early spring. It takes 15 to 20 years for it to produce nuts. The exfoliating bark, so shagbark hickory, it looks like the, the bark is peeling off. It provides um, nesting places as well as hiding places for many pollinators as well as bats if you're for roosting bats. This tree is very resistant to our harsh Illinois winters. So if you're those are trees that are for pollinators. So now we're going to switch over to trees that have some very showy spring flowers. I would imagine most of you probably know what this one is. This is the eastern red bud one of the first trees that flowers out in the spring. It has these beautiful pink flowers and heart-shaped leaves. It's a small tree. Um, it can be multi-stemmed or single-stemmed. They live about 75 years, um, but it should be planted in a more protected area. It should not be planted out in the wide open because they're very prone to breaking in strong winds and it does not tolerate wet at all. So if you have an area that floods regularly or is wet often, a red bud is not the tree for that location. Another tree with showy flowers is a service berry. So there are about 20 different species of service berries. Um, also called a shad bush or a shad blow, a Juneberry. They have these beautiful white blooms in the flower or in the spring. Again, they can be multi stemmed like this one is, or they can be a single stem. They do have um, reddish purple fruits that mature in the summer, and they're actually very good to eat if you can get to them before the birds do. This gets this tree is a sm another small tree. It gets about 25 feet tall at maturity. It does prefer full sun to partial sun. And this is a, a favorite tree of um, many of you are birders, uh, really like Baltimore Orioles, Cedar Waxwings. They love the, the service berries, the fruits. Another one you're probably familiar with is the crab apple. This is a member of the rose family. Um, they get up to about 25 feet tall. They also prefer full sun to partial sun. They're, they live about 50 years. Um, 
like other apple trees, this is in the apple family, they are very susceptible to many diseases and pests, the same as apple fruit trees are. Um, but you can use the crab apples, the fruits, um, to make jellies and cider and vinegar if you so desire. It does flower with the berries. So this is another one. So now we're gonna get into a few trees that have beautiful fall color. This one is my favorite one of all is the sassafras. Um, it's, it has three different shaped leaves. It has one that looks like a pitchfork, one that looks like a football, and one that looks like a mitten with a thumb. Um, it has, they get about between 30 and 60 feet tall, but they can get up to 100 feet. They're fairly fast growing. They prefer full sun to partial sun. They are allelopathic, which means they release compounds um, through their roots that inhibit anything growing around them. So you can't plant things under a sassafras tree because it will not survive. The, the allelopathic compounds will kill them. So it also has these um, bottom right picture are the fruits. They're called droops. But this is a beautiful tree, it turns a um, burnt orange, reddish color in the fall. Another one with beautiful fall color is the red oak. Um, the, this is a large shade tree. It gets about 75 feet tall. It's real easy to transplant. Um, it's two years for acorns to develop. So red oaks, the red oak family, they produce acorns every other year. This tree can live up to 500 years. Um, the bark is deeply furrowed, which means it has deep grooves in the bark. So if you're looking at a mature red oak tree, if you're looking at the top, towards the top of the tree, it looks like there's ski tracks coming down the top. And those are the deep furrows. Um, this is susceptible to oak wilt. So if you know there's oak wilt in your neighborhood, I would not plant this. Um, oak wilt is a disease affecting oak trees that is spread through um, the roots that they graft together. So if you don't have any other oaks in your yard, this could be an option for you. Beautiful fall color with the deep reds. This is the only um, non-native tree on my list that I'm gonna talk about. And just because I think it's so unique, uh, the ginkgo is native to China. It has the distinct fan-shaped leaves. It turns this brilliant gold color in the fall. Um, they are very long-lived trees. They are The fossils of these trees date back 270 million years ago. They grow to between 60 and 120 feet tall at maturity. They like full sun. They are very long lived because they are non native. They are not originally from the United States or Illinois, they're from China. They don't tend to have any disease problems and they are rarely attacked by insects. They are very well adapted to the urban environment. They tolerate pollution, they tolerate tight soil spaces. Um, the downside is that the female trees, these trees are male and female. And if you get a female tree, they produce a very stinky fruit. Um, and you don't know that until they get mature, whether it's a, a male or a female. So um, you hope that when you go to a nursery and you get purchase a ginkgo that they have owned a male tree and that that's what you're getting because the fruits of the female tree are very bad smelling. Another tree that has beautiful fall color is our state tree, Illinois state tree, the white oak. These are a large mature, at large shade tree up to a hundred feet tall, very slow growing, but very long lived up to 600 years. Um, these do not like water, so these would be more in a drier area, drier part of your yard, um, because they do not tolerate flooding. 
This is the quintessential wildlife tree. Um, provides the acorns for uh, birds and mammals, as well as the, the pollinators eat the leaves. Um, in the fall, it turns a reddish purple to brown. So this is a beautiful tree with the, the whitish colored bark. Then looking at shade trees. So all of these trees get about up 80 feet tall or more. This is a tulip tree or also called a tulip poplar. Um, it has this unique leaf shape in the shape of a tulip flower. These get up to, can get up to 120 feet tall. They, a tulip tree is the largest, tallest hardwood in North America. They prefer full to partial sun. Uh, they grow fairly fast and they produce the flowers, which are in the bottom right, in less than 10 years. So they have these beautiful yellow, orange, and green flowers, and they do have seed pods that fall off. Um, the bark is furrowed of the, of the trunk, but a beautiful tree, great shade tree. Again, it's the tallest tree in North America, tallest hardwood. Hackberry, I like hackberries. A lot of people don't like hackberries. Um, they get 40, average about 80 feet tall. They have um, uneven leaf bases. So their um, leaves are asymmetric. And oftentimes they have little bumps on the bottom of the leaves. Those are insect galls. They don't hurt the tree at all. Uh, this is a great tree for, um, it produces berries in the fall for the birds for overwintering. It has very distinctive bark. Um, it's the, when the tree is younger, the bark really looks like it has warts on it, um, like on a witch's nose, but as it, the tree matures, that is less noticeable. It grows fairly rapidly. Um, they live about 150 to 200 years old. It's a great shade tree and good for wildlife as well. This is Kentucky coffee tree. It's one that's not, they, we don't see a whole lot. There are uh, multiple cultivars of this, all have um, coffee names like latte and espresso that don't have these big seed pods with them. Um, this is a, up to 75 to 80 feet tall, full to partial sun. Young trees grow very quickly. Um, they have alternate doubly pinnate compound leaves. What that means is that um, what you see in the bottom right, that is all one leaf. Um, so it, a lot of shade or a lot of sunlight uh, spark, sprinkles through the leaves. So it's not, you don't get dense shade with these. Um, they do have these seed pods um, that are toxic to uh, many animals. They won't eat them. But like I said, there are many cultivars of this, all with coffee names, coffee themed names that you can get that do not have the, that are sterile. They don't have the seed pods. But this is a great tree. When when it's young, I consider it like the ugly duckling of the tree world because they, it's just, if a tree can be homely looking, this one is it when it's young. It just, it's just a stick, literally, until it gets a little bit bigger and it starts leafing out and getting more branches. Um, but one, at a mature size, it's, it's a gorgeous tree. This is another large shade tree, bald cypress. You don't have to have wet areas to plant a bald cypress. Um, if you do, this is a perfect tree for a wet area. They get about 120 feet tall, 80 to 120 feet tall. They have um, needles. So this is a deciduous evergreen. So it means that it actually loses its needles every single year. Evergreens generally don't lose their needles, but this one does. So don't think it died if all the needles fall off in the fall. It has a pyramid shape. It produces a round cone, unlike other um, evergreen trees. 
if it's planted near water, it may develop knees. Um, and those knees are used to help stabilize it in and around water. So very common, if anyone has seen them in Southern Illinois, in the swamps, um, they, you can see all the knees, but most commonly uh, planted in urban areas, you're not gonna see the knees. Um, cold sun, they like wet to moist conditions. They are very winter hardy and they live up to 200 years or more. Some have lived upwards of over a thousand. So this is a, another great shade tree. Now, planting and caring for your trees. Um, when you purchase a tree, um, you're either, it's either, most likely either going to be in a pot or wrapped in bald and burlapped. If it is in a pot, you need to remove the pot and um, cut through the roots because the roots are circling the pot. And if you just plant them as is, that those roots will continue to circle and shorten the life of your tree. If you're planting a large tree that has ball and burlap, you need to remove as much of the wire and as much of the burlap as possible. You want to dig the hole twice as wide as the root ball and to the depth so that the root flare, which is where the trunk flares out towards the roots at the base, um, is at or above ground level. So this is an example of what happens if you don't cut those roots and you go ahead and just plant it straight out of the pot into the ground. You'll see the roots are girdling the stem, which means it's cutting it off, basically suffocating the tree. They continue to grow in a circular fashion and eventually the tree fails because of the, the girdling roots. It's recommended that you mulch around your trees. Um, it helps keep weeds down, um, also helps keep lawnmowers and weed whackers away from the trunk of your tree. It helps retain water moisture, um, helps uh, regulate the soil prevent soil compaction, adds more organic matter into the soil. So it's highly recommended to go ahead and mulch all of your trees that you plant um, that are in your yard, particularly any newly planted trees. When you mulch, do not volcano mulch. So just say no to volcano mulching. You wanna mulch wide and about two to four inches deep. So if you put your three uh, middle fingers together, you don't want your mulch to be any deeper than that. Think of your mulching as like um, a bagel with your tree coming up through the center of your bagel and none of the mulch is touching the trunk of the tree. This is what happens if you do the volcano mulching. Um, it rots the bark. It also provides an opportunity for rodents to burrow into that mulch and eat the, the bark and the trunk. And then it also causes the roots to um, girdle, grow up in the mulch because they think it's still at ground level and girdle the trunk. So just say no to volcano mulching. You want it wide and shallow. You also wanna protect it from any type of damage. So for instance, if you need to stake your tree, you can do that, but you need to remove the stakes after two years. Do not leave them on any longer. Um, clearly this rope on the left is left on way too long and the tree is growing over it. Mulching also helps prevent lawnmower damage, which is a common occurrence on our trees and weed whacker damage eventually that can, enough damage can kill your tree. Watering your newly planted trees, you need to give it 10 to 15 gallons of water per week. That, so basically it's for every inch circumference that the trunk is, that needs to get two to three gallons of water per week. Um, particularly for at least for the first two years. If you were in a drought, you need to water not only your newly planted trees, but you need to water your mature trees in your yard as well. 
every week unless we get an inch of rain until the ground freezes. There are different ways you can, you can water your trees. You can do the gator bags that you fill up. Um, you can do a slow trickle garden hose, or you could just do a bucket, a five gallon bucket, punch a hole in the bottom of it, or like the person is, and just, you know, water your tree. But you don't wanna just water it right up around the trunk because the roots spread out. So you want to water within the root zone, which is the where the um, branches are spread out. So you want to water that entire area. Weeding, if you mulch, you don't have to weed, but um, weeding, uh, weeds invite littering and are an eyesore and it competes for water and nutrients on newly planted trees. So it's recommended that you mulch your newly planted trees for the first several years at least. So with that, um, here's my email. If you have any questions, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my, put my video back on here. Stop sharing and go to the, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Of small to medium trees to help with water because you have drainage issues. Okay. Yes. If you look on the um, our trees and shrubs for pollinators, um, a medium sized tree that I really like is a black tupelo. Um, it it has a, it's fairly slow growing, but it has, it turns a really deep burgundy color in the fall. I really like that one. Um, you could do, trying to think of some, some of the smaller ones. A hop hornbeam, which is a different one, that, that one also would do well with water issues. Um, you can refer to our website and look at any of those on there, um, bald cypress would be too big because that's a large tree. Um, but look at the trees and shrubs for pollinators and, it, and it'll tell you which ones are, are for wet areas. A, a buckeye tree perhaps would be a good one. It just depends on, on what you're looking for. I would encourage you to research the nurseries that you're looking at. And I would encourage you to purchase your trees from a reputable nursery and not just go to the local um, big box store to buy your trees. Because if you get them from a local nursery, the, at least they know where they're coming from. With the big box stores, you don't know if the tree was, the seeds are from Florida and grown in Texas and then brought to Illinois. You just don't know where those trees come from. So use a reputable nursery. There are many in the um, Chicagoland area that you can contact and they would be more than willing to, to help you. You're very welcome, Sarah. Anyone else have any questions they would like to ask? Why don't I allow everyone, if they want, uh, they can turn their microphone on and uh, ask in case the tech is interfering for somebody. Um, I wanted to ask though, Sarah, uh, is there any rule of thumb related to the people who lost trees last summer? Is there a certain amount of time they should wait? Is this spring just perfectly fine for them or? It just depends on if they have, um, if they lost trees last year with the, the tornado, you just want to make sure that any construction that's happening or has happened is completed before you think about planting new trees. Um, you don't want to be still repairing your home um, and planting new trees and still having equipment driving through. So just make sure that all the construction on your property is completed before you put new trees in the ground. Eleanor and Nancy, did you either of you have a question? Uh, okay, 
uh, I had two trees in the backyard that had to be cut down. Now mm -hmm. the roots, they were maple and the root systems were very large. Yep. Where can I put a new tree? How far okay. away? Um, you can put a new tree probably about two feet away, 18 inches to two feet away from the old tree. But, oh, know no, that you, but know that you will be going through those roots. And so you probably have to have like an auger to cut through those roots to, to get the tree in the ground. Okay, but I can plant it back close to where the other tree was. Yep, you can plant it, in, you know, generally 18 inches to 24 inches away is a minimum. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't have any questions. I'm just enjoying this, but I lost <laughs> I, I lost the vi the visual, so I'm just hearing it, unfortunately. Well, we're glad you're joining us anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Oh, that was uh, that was Debbie. I think it has to do with our view related to the um, speaker. Uh, Nancy. Well, I think that part of the reason we don't have a lot of questions is, Debbie, that was incredibly thorough. I, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate that your website uh, has those resources.